For those who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures Conference happened at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s at a tipping point at the technologization of first world cultures. Whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian put it, its actual aim hidden behind the brush steel, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic prophets, and the techno parties was much more sober and much more urgent. What they did was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific uh, theory and technological development. This salon series completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. Again, Virtual Futures has been tasked with saving the term virtual reality or VR from the appropriation under which its meaning has all but disintegrated. With all of the distractions created by and through 360 degree video based entertainment, we forget the real power of VR. The opportunity it affords in allowing us to experiment en masse with the types of media that take individuals into other subjective realities. These sorts of immersive experiences have the ability to put the viewer in somebody else's body or mind. In fact, they're so vastly different from the sorts of commercial VR that we've come to know that it might be more fitting to call these uh, or might be more fitting to use the definition embodiment systems. And through seeing oneself in the body of another, it is hoped that we might be able to stimulate and simulate empathy as a form of embodied interaction. In these systems, virtual reality is merely the interface that interferes with our sensory modalities. And the effectiveness of this interface means that these experiences have already been explored and already found to be legitimate application in things such as healthcare and therapy. These systems have been shown to be affected as, as effective as morphine even at reducing uh, sensitivity to chronic pain. They can normalize the fight or flight area in the brain of soldiers with post-traumatic stress disorder. They can effectively induce body ownership, i.e. men can emphasize with women, the old can understand the young, and perhaps it can be used to reduce the implicit or implicit racial biases. But what exactly makes these experiences so effective? These projects have gained a large amount of scientific legitimacy following the possible discovery of mirror neurons in the human brain. And in addition, new studies showing how individuals interact with these embodiment systems reveal how this media is able to evoke the sorts of responses provoked by this consensus reality. There are two key phenomena that make these tricks of the mind possible. The feeling of being there or place illusion and the plausibility illusion or the illusion that's depicted that the scenario that you're in is actually happening. But all of this leaves a question mark over whether these embodiment systems might also be inversely effective at, say, inflicting pain or even false memory, causing trauma rather than treating it. So tonight, I'm joined by an incredible lineup of panelists who are, and in their own ways, encouraging a vibrant exploration of immersive media for exploring personal agency. Hopefully, they will help us understand what these therapeutic applications of VR might be able to teach us about this tricky term, immersion. And perhaps together, tonight, we might be able to work out how to talk to that deep part of our brain that says, I'm here. So, to kick off this panel, I want to turn to Christian. And Christian's, uh, we're blessed to have Christian here in London with us. Uh, Christian runs a company called uh, Be Another Lab, and you guys are usually based 
Um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but usually based in Barcelona, but the collective is, is spanning all over, all over the, uh, the world from what I understand. So the thing I want to know is what is machine to be another and what makes it an embodiment system, to return to that term? So um, the machine to be another, we started about uh, 2012, uh, inspired very much by different kinds of research that was done within the field of cognitive science. Um, looking at how the senses work, how there's uh, interaction between the different senses and how you can play with that and alter your sense of uh, body ownership, let's say. So um, we looked at work being done by Henrik Erikson, for instance. Um, well, for instance, like the way it works, like now I'm speaking with a microphone, you know, like you hear it coming out of the speakers, but you're associating it as coming out from my body, even though it's, you're maybe only hearing it from the speakers. Our senses are constantly interfering with each other. So the idea uh, with how the system works is we use a virtual reality headset, which substitutes your visual feedback. And we're using not so much VR as telepresence, where we use a camera on another person. And so what you do is you swap perspectives. And if the users are in sync with their movements, and if the spaces they're in uh, are identical, and the objects are, in, are identical as well, then you have this kind of performative element, which allows them to also feel what they are touching, or have agency over that body, reach out, and touch this glass or this bottle, which is in front of me, uh, but is also in front of the other person. So everything is the same, uh, like they have agency, their proprioception is the same, their sense of touch is the same, but the body they see is different. And so with that, that's kind of the basic way it works, and on top of that we add layers of narrative and explore different things about identity within that space. So what are some of the experiments you've done with the machines being another? I know the, the most well-known one is gender swapping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got the, yeah, the, we, we did stuff with the gender. We started um, looking, well, it was really just how we were organized. It was very much, we had this op open kind of lab set up where people would come from different, uh, different people off the street, different community groups, and really what we tried to do was show them what we were doing and saying, okay, how, how is this relevant to you? How do you want to use it? And then push things in the direction that they thought were interesting. So we worked with uh, different women's groups. We worked with uh, communities of uh, immigrants in Barcelona. Uh, people with physical disabilities as well, dancers, all different kinds of people that wanted to use these kind of uh, technology, these kind of system that we developed to uh, create an experience or share a story in some way. So you use that term body ownership. So what do you mean by body ownership and how does the setup work in, in so far as it allows people to have the ownership of somebody else's morphology or someone else's body? Mm -hmm. So there's uh, other stuff that's been done, um, for instance, in Event Lab and stuff like this, where they've used motion capture systems. So you're in a virtual world, and you're wearing like a suit with, uh, or you're using a Kinect or something like this. And uh, as you move, you see your virtual body moving in that space. Um, there's also haptics, electronic haptics, and so forth. You have little vibrotactile motors, different things like this. So um, while a lot of these experiments were happening in a virtual environment, uh, we decided what would happen if this was happening with real people instead of using digital avatars. And so that allowed uh, us to also explore the capabilities of touch, which, you know, your skin is extremely, you know, sensitive. Like you have temperature, you have weight, you have, you know, texture, all different kinds of uh, senses within the sense of touch. Um, so within that, we play with that and... Uh, by substituting your visual and having all the other senses the same, you have the sense of body ownership there. And I think the using real people in this in this case or telepresence, as it may be, um, allowed kind of I think a deeper resolution of uh, of the senses in terms of at least the tactility in comparison to virtual environments. Let's say. And, and the machinery of that project, you were seeing it was a camera. Camera based, yeah. So we would have. I should have shown a video actually, but because it's kind of a bit involved to explain. But you have. It's quite simple, really. You have uh, two like Oculus Rift or whatever headsets and uh, cameras, which are swapped uh, in the perspectives. There's a bit of software that does some clever stuff when you're moving around, but other than that, it's entirely up to the users to synchronize their movements. If you have one person that's a performer, they would copy everything I do. Or if we have one that's a swap between two people, we try to, we play this kind of game of like sort of moving together, mimicking each other's movements, and that's really what uh, what generates that that feeling. Uh, and I want to return uh, later on to some of those effects and affects. Um, but firstly, Jane, uh, Jane Gauntlet, you run um, a project called uh, In My Shoes, or the In My Shoes Project. And I know that you've been exploring a similar theme of this body ownership, but I just wondered, could you tell us a little bit about the In My Shoes Project and what motivated you to, to start that? Sure. So the In My Shoes Project is... Um, 
ever-expanding library of interactive experiences, I take a real-life story and recreate it using touch, taste, smell and technology. My focus is very much on narrative, so it's all very much about the story. I take a real life story and work with someone very closely to put someone in their shoes. And I like to push people as far as I can, so I constantly explore new ideas. Um, and In My Shoes came from a personal experience. In 2007, I had a brain injury. I was in a coma for three weeks. I lost the ability to walk and talk. It was a real problem for me. I really struggled to go back to work. Um, six months later, I developed epilepsy. And it was something that I was very, um, I was finding it very hard to communicate what it was like. People were quite frightened of me. For them, I looked a bit like the girl from The Exorcist. Um, and I did all sorts of ridiculous things before and after seizures. Um, I've woken up in strangers' houses wearing nothing but a pair of their wife fronts. This is a kindness thing, nothing bad happened, that sounds much more sinister than it is. But I wanted to help them to understand me, but I also wanted to open a dialogue. I wanted them to feel comfortable talking to me about my experiences, I didn't want them to feel embarrassed or... I wanted them to laugh when I told them silly stories about what had happened. Um, and the first piece, so in 2011 I founded the In My Shoes project, and the first piece I made was called Waking in Slough. And it's a recreation of an epileptic seizure I had on a train. And um, it's a seizure that I remember quite well. I quite often don't. Um, and I learned about some technology called Fusic. So they're video goggles. So they're old school video goggles. They're not as snazzy and they don't move around when you move your head. I've got a clip of it actually. That's probably the best way. I think I could ramble for a while, but maybe I should just show you a film clip. But I like. So I'd like you to use a bit of your imagination. Imagine I've just given you my handbag, my notebook and my pen, and I've just given you a bottle of water. I've given you a headset and told you that these are my eyes, and I've given you some headphones and told you that through these you'll hear my thoughts. And this is what you see through the headsets. Close your eyes. My name is Jane, and you will spend the next 10 minutes in my shoes. I spend the evening at the theatre with friends, but my story begins alone on a train platform at Oxford Railway Station, on my way home. Your hands are my hands, my actions are your actions. Fill my bag on my shoulder, my watch on my wrist, and a bottle of water in my hand. Open my eyes. About time to shut the train. Close my eyes. When I open my eyes, I will be on the train. Open my eyes. So that's the first part. Um, and in that, so in the beginning, we make it smell a bit like urine because that's what Oxford train station smells like that late at night. Um, and we have someone around you creating the wind. So when the train goes past, we have someone standing there using fans so that you feel the air of the train. Um, and then the next bit, it guides you through. And actually, we learned very quickly that people follow. I walk forward, I walk down the train, and people actually follow my actions. We started off the first piece we made. We said, right foot, left foot. But we very quickly learned that people really didn't need that sort of instruction. So it's been a really interesting way to explore how far we can push audiences. And I've been using, I made my first 360 video last year, and we've been using um, them as an educational tool. We've been using them in medical schools, and we've piloted it in Parliament as a way to promote empathy in Parliament, which is something I'd really like to do a bit more of. Um, so exploring ways to use it has been really good fun. So it started off as a personal thing, but I'm really enjoying making them about other people. And it's, it's that word that we uh, titled this panel on electronic empathy, and you talk about um, 
empathy that can, that can be taught. What does that word empathy mean in this context and is it a thing that can be taught? I get asked that a lot and it comes up a lot as um, empathy machine comes a lot as, up a lot as well. Is VR an empathy machine? I don't think it is. I think human beings are empathy machines. Um, I think can empathy be taught is a really difficult question. Um, in terms of using this as a way for me to promote empathy, I found it to be quite effective. I can't say that it's been effective for everybody, but um, the impact that it's had on my relationships with my medical consultant. I'll never, I showed it to him, and I'll never forget him taking off the goggles. And the way he looked at me was just completely different. And I felt like he understood my ambitions, where I was going. It put him in a place where he was able to understand more. It's, I basically, I felt like my medical care went from being, um, I'm going to stop your seizures, to being, I'm going to help you improve your quality of life. And also my friendships, um, and also the stories people have shared with me have been really important to me. The dialogues, people coming up to me and saying I haven't spoken to my employer about empathy. Um, we showed it in Sheffield Documentary Festival, and um, somebody actually took off the goggles of um, the new piece that we've made. And she, she was crying and she said, I met Jane at an event and I didn't show her any empathy. I didn't, you know, I, I wish I'd show, I was frustrated. She wasn't explaining herself very well. I'm saying this by, um, it's Chinese whispers, I wasn't there, so forgive me if I've got it wrong. But it was, you know, to be able to, and then when we're using it as a training thing for um, customer services, if some, it's, the idea is that if someone's running at you and shouting, rather than shouting back, think about why they are. Put yourself in their shoes. Um, what are they going through? How would you feel if you were in that situation? And a better way to diffuse it than to... Sorry, I ramble a bit, don't I? Sorry, that was a bit perfect. of a long answer. I suppose it's perfect. What's interesting about both of your work is that you use these, these headsets as, as the uh, medium through which you receive the other video content or the recorded content. And I know, Sylvia, you've been, you've been living in headset land at Goldsmiths for, um, for many years researching this thing called virtual reality. And I just want to ask you, is it, um, what's unique about virtual reality? What's unique about that medium that it has the ability to perhaps create emphatic experiences. Yes. Is there something unique about VR? Yes, I mean, definitely. I mean, VR it basically is about illusion of being somewhere else rather than where you actually are. And this, as you said, is explained, is supported by something called place illusion, proposed by Mouse later in 2009. And there are three important factors we need in order for place illusion to happen, which is supported by the VR systems uh, we have nowadays. The first one is 3D stereo display. That's easy to understand. I'm sure most of you have been to a 3D cinema. You all see how more realistic a 3D movie is compared to a 2D one. Okay, so that's fairly straightforward. And the second one is very wide field of view. Um, to the extent that when you look both horizontally or vertically, you, are, you only see visual display, virtual reality. You don't see anything of the real reality. This means that when you look around, you see virtual reality, so there's no escape for you to come out of it. As an example, when you go to see a 3D movie in an IMAX with a much bigger screen, the illusion is stronger. But obviously, when you put a headset on, you can't even say, look to your friends sitting next to you. They don't exist anymore. And that's when the illusion really also kicks into a different level. And this is also kind of you know, easy to understand, not too hard to understand. The third one, however, if you haven't tried an immersive VR headset, it's really, really difficult to explain. So this is supported by the technology of head tracking, which means that when you put a HMD on, you have a little tracker here that's working in real time with the 3D stimuli you actually see uh, in both of your eyes. And the tiny little movement you, you do with your head actually synchronized with the display. And normally this includes both uh, rotation tracking and precision tracking. And when you try a VR device, pay attention to these two. Not all VR devices have a mountain display actually have both of these factors, and they could work to different degrees as well. So really, really expensive systems have a, a more real time, which means that when you move your head, 
the display actually updates really uh, with milliseconds of, this, uh, of delay, and that's really important. And it's also important in a way that when I want to see, say, what's underneath the, stair, uh, the chair in real life, I just use my body to observe, oh, nice shoes. But um, if in virtual reality I was, I'm also able to do that, then something at the lower left of my brain basically thinks, oh, this is really real. Right, so I really, my brain really automatically takes the virtual, uh, virtual display as if it were real. And also, uh, position tracking is also important because if I'm talking to Julia and I get closer to her, she becomes bigger. And if I don't have this sensation in virtual reality, it wouldn't work the same way as what our, how our brain is used to. So yeah, that's basically the three important technical uh, aspects to make immersive virtual reality to work. And that's why it differs from most of the other sort of media um, we, we see nowadays. And because of those things, does it, does it make it a highly effective or perhaps ill-effective uh, medium for exploring this thing called empathy? I know you've done some work in yes. social anxiety yes. and using VR in that. Yes. So once you have this illusion, you are another, you're in a different world, we can then, you know, can have generate uh, virtual uh, displays, virtual events that are happening in this real world, which you will react to. And that goes to the sort of, uh, Another concept that makes VR work, which is plausibility, which is uh, orthogonal to the concept of place illusion. And these two together gives you a sense of immersion or presence, as people uh, say nowadays. And so this plausibility illusion, what does this mean? It means that if situation events that happen in VR actually correlate to your action, actually relates personally to you, then you react towards these events as if they were real. As an example, I work a lot with virtual characters. Instead of you know, taking videos of real people, I work with mesh and skeleton and try to animate them. Um, so we generate virtual characters. And if you are actually immersed in a virtual environment and you see a virtual character sitting there, and because we have your head tracking data, we can make the virtual character look at you straight into your eyes. And the virtual character can also detect how close you are to them. And they can kind of lean their body backward or they can smile at you. And this will, then you will have an automatic positive impression towards a virtual character if they smile at you. In fact, you might actually smile back, as, we, as lots of experimental data have shown. So we've been using the fact that people do realistically react to virtual characters um, in uh, experimental studies in social anxiety. So part of my PhD was actually about creating a psychotherapy for social phobia, uh, for people who are really afraid of social interactions. So they just kind of lock them at home. You know, the more they're afraid to avoid social interactions, the worse they actually become at it. But then we're hoping to use virtual uh, reality, virtual characters to help them to go through this experience, but in a more controlled and risk-free fashion so that they regain their confidence, they learn how to control their anxiety, and to get them back into um, real social interactions, which we hope them, uh, that they can enjoy. So that's the kind of work that I, I've been doing. And finally, Julia, I asked you on this panel not because of the work that you do in virtual reality, but the work you do thinking about memory. So you play with that reality between our ears that exists in our brain, and you're working on this thing called the memory illusion. Could you just explain that to an audience who may not know anything about what the memory illusion is and how you mess with people's realities? Uh, so I'm a psychological scientist. Um, I create fiction in reality, if that makes any sense. Um, I don't actually believe in the concept of reality. So the whole idea of virtual versus non-virtual reality becomes partly meaningless, because I think that we all create our own reality anyways. Uh, and I demonstrate that in my research, where I create false memories. Now, false memories, we've all had them. We all have them regularly. Often we don't know we have them, but we can sometimes see them in other people. False memories are memories that we think we have that are false in the sense that they didn't actually happen, you didn't actually experience that thing, or see that thing, or go to that thing with that person. And this is where sometimes you go, you weren't there at that event that I went to the other day, and they're insisting they did, and you're insisting they didn't. One of you must be wrong, right? So one of you must have a false memory. And it's different than forgetting, because you're adding a piece of reality rather than taking something away. In my research, I go to the extreme. I take it past the everyday kinds of false memories where you think you've forgotten the keys by the door, but they're obviously not there. And I go to convince people that they have committed crimes that never happened. So I get you to come into my lab 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's video footage of this that you can see that I'm not going to show you today. Um, you come into my, into my lab for three interviews. So you don't need virtual reality for this. You could just do this by talking to people. Um, you come in, you think you're there for an emotional memory study. I gain your trust. Just by getting you to picture committing a crime and you trusting me that I know that you did it, over three sessions, three sessions later, 70% of you will be telling me all about the crime <laughs> where you assaulted someone, assaulted someone with a weapon, or stole something with police contact. Now, why do I do this? <laughs> uh, not just out of personal interest, because I like messing with people's memories, but because this is really important for things like the criminal justice system. So my background is in criminal psychology. Um, and when we talk about faulty memories in everyday situations, sure, it can lead to arguments, it can lead to discrepancies, it can lead to issues about who we think we are. And this is where it breaches into empathy, breaches into virtual stuff, but we'll talk about that when we chat. Um, so it can lead to questions of who we think we are if we get it wrong, right? If you think you've experienced important childhood events that never took place, or forgotten, or distorted important events in your life, that can have an impact on who you think you are now and the things you cap think, you think you're, you're capable of in the future. Um, but in the justice system, you can send innocent people to jail. You can have PTSD for an event that never took place. And this is where the consequences are so severe that I think it's critical that we continue researching this blurry boundary between things that people actually experience and things that they think they have experienced but haven't. So, that's my research in a nutshell, creating, getting people to think they did things that never happened. They're called false memories. I also like to call them memory illusions. That's partly because that's what I called my book, The Memory Illusion, because your memory is just an illusion, as is virtual reality. So, so I want to, it's so early on, but I want to ask the ethics question. I mean, how far can you push audiences with some of the work that, say, you do at uh, Be Another Lab? Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely an important question, and I think it's one that we've uh, tackled in different ways. And one of our, the main reasons that we've been working uh, in this interdisciplinary way, mostly within an artistic context, is that it allows us to kind of subvert the kind of hierarchies that are in place within the different disciplines. So within the scientific one, you'd have someone go through, you know, you have to pass an ethics committee because you have people coming through, they're your experimental subject, you have everything lined up, they do everything, and then you say thank you and goodbye, and then that's kind of, that's, they don't have much say into what happens. You have to kind of decide that beforehand. Our process is a bit different uh, in the sense that we try to co-create everything together with the people that are taking part. So we'll do these workshops, and like if we're working with narratives, we're working with different performers, different community groups, especially people that are vulnerable in different ways or from marginalized groups, it's very important to kind of set a level playing field and not really kind of take entire control or kind of have this hierarchical structure within there. So that's how we do it on that end. In terms of uh, users going in, that's a bit more ambiguous. Uh, it really depends on the context of where we're showing it or how we're involving people. Um, it's something that we're figuring out as we go. It is not really a, a precedent for what's okay and what's not. It's something that we're very careful with, though, because we do know people have had very strong kind of experiences within the system. We've had people crying. We've had people having different issues and so forth, and very good ones, too. And I think that seeing the power of it is really what motivates us to keep on doing it. But really, the, but it's, it's a delicate path to walk, you know, especially when you're, you're working with, uh, with, uh, with human beings, no? you know? Like, uh, do you find that the same in your practice, Jane? Is there a, a, a almost tightrope that you have to walk with regards to how you deal with other individuals in, in your eyes? Absolutely. It's something that um, we have to be quite aware of. And there aren't very many specific guidelines. When we showed it at Sheffield Documentary Festival, it was the first time I'd been asked if there was an age limitation. Um, so it's just thinking very much about that. Am I going to take responsibility? You know, how... Yeah, it's something we've always got to be very careful about. But I think, yeah, emotionally, it has been quite hard on people in positive and negative ways. Um, I get a lot of hugs from my job, which is very nice. Um, but it's a very complex situation. So if anyone ha wants to talk to me about it and knows more about it, I'm interested, because it's a difficult question to answer. So where does that complexity come from? So is it the fact that it's so personal, this work is so personal, or is it the fact that you're dealing with someone that you know nothing 
about when they're going to that experience? Well, I guess my work is very much, it's a documentary. So it's like with any documentary, what's the age limit, what are the... Problems? I think something that I've become very aware of making this piece about myself is how hard it can be on me, actually. So very much something else I'm very aware of is making new pieces of work with other people and how I protect them, how I warn them, how I... Because people quite often think they know me better than they do. And people make all sorts of assumptions. And I wonder if people get memories from it. I'm really curious about that, by the way. I'm into my trickery with VR. I think it works really well. But I'm afraid I can't answer that question very well, can I? I haven't done a very good job. Um, I think it's just like with any other film or theatre production. Um, it's about thinking about what restrictions. And, and, and is it almost... Is, is performance, it's a theatre piece rather than a piece of video? I mean, you see your work... Um, from what I've seen and what I've read and how we discussed on the phone, these are pieces of performance work and you use those same uh, tropes from theatre and from making theatre when you make these virtual reality works. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So my background's in theatre and interactive theatre and I'm very much into creating, um, recreating reality um, and making things convincing. Um, so giving audiences agency. That's something I'm really curious about. So yeah, it's very much using interactive theatre techniques to intensify audience experience. So I guess really, I do feel like it's any other film or theatre piece when I'm thinking about taking responsibility. Doing it. And, and Sylvia, how authentic do those experiences need to be for you to feel like you're there in your own work in, yeah. with social anxiety? I mean, some this work started out with 8-bit yeah, yeah, we actually touched the ethic problem. I mean, I, I run lots of experimental studies as psychologists. You, uh, Julia must know very well, we have to apply for ethical uh, approvals for all the experiments we conduct. And uh, so uh, one of my postdoc work was in Moral Dilemma, actually. So we directly give people the task to operate a lift where you have people going up or downstairs. And at one point, we had five people upstairs, five virtual characters upstairs, and one person downstairs. And we had a, another person coming in and you know, asked to be taken to, to the upstairs floor. And the guy started shooting the five person. And then you have to make a choice either do nothing, let him kill the five people on the first floor, or, or push a lever to bring this person down, sacrifice the person downstairs, but save the five. So this is the sort of alternative version of the classic trolley uh, problem. And so actually, you know, when we applied for ethics, you know, I was just doing it as a computer scientist, but we were actually told that we need to really do a proper debriefing after this experiment, making sure everything is fine. I was just sort of taking it quite lightly until I start running the experiment and saw how people react in the situation. And more so, you know, this is the only experiment that after the experiment, participant keep on, kept on asking me, did I do the right thing? I think, you know, I think maybe it was, I did this, but then I did that. It was kind of trying to uh, conform with me if they have done the right thing. And I had people emailing me afterwards, want to discuss this further with me. So that's when I really realized we're really going into really interesting territory here. Now, we actually conducted the same experiment, both in a cave-like system, which is immersive VR, as I explained, and a little desktop system. Uh, but then in you know, the desktop system, I realized people were just sort of doing it as playing a computer game. They were, when the guys started shooting, they were like laughing rather than sort of taking it seriously. And we also had a post questionnaire uh, with a classic trolley problem. And we, we noticed that people became more utilitarian after the immersive VR system. So that's, that's sort of the, the implication of ethics is really interesting here. But I also like to point that Immersive virtual reality is actually a very useful alternative tool to explore territories and, and ethical problems that you won't be able to explore in real life. You know, these things could be, you know, scary to do it in VR, but if you don't do it in VR, you can't do it in real life. Like the Mugwin experiment was also um, uh, implemented in VR, which is, again, un unethical to do it uh, in real life as an experiment. And of course, Julia, you, you have certain clinical um, guidelines through which you have to follow, but I just wonder the thing with virtual reality that we were talking about at the opening here is it's available or possibly available to everyone, consumer VR. So if they have that sort of power to start manipulating, should there be guidelines across all of these consumer or DIY activations perhaps? 
So, so I'm not a clinician. Um, I am a, a scientist. Um, but that being said, for me, the question is always, how can we use this te technology, they say, talking to people, in your case, actual technology, um, to undo PTSD? So sort of undo harm, take away memories, or distort memories, to change memories that are really important. Um, so I think in terms of ethics, there's, ah, same thing, I get participants later on, but I think in terms of empathy, this is really important. I think what I'm teaching, anyone who does this kind of study realizes this can happen to me, and this can probably happen to other people. The idea that we all get things wrong, that all of our memories are malleable, and maybe even, man, given the right circumstances and the right reasons, I might be capable of committing a crime. And I think that's really important for empathy. And for ethics, back to your question, um, I think it's critical to know how we debrief people, how we deal with those kinds of revelations. Because on the one hand, they're so fundamental to what we're doing. We're doing them to get people to empathize, to get people to understand that these things are possible, and to see them happening, to show to other people that this is what's happening. But we need to make sure that those individuals are leaving better or at the same level as when they came in. That's really ethics. Sort of the key thing is don't leave your participants in a worse state than when they got there. Um, and incredibly important to consider in everything that we all do um, when you're trying to change people's belief systems, which is sort of what we're doing. We're showing people a whole new world. Um, and so I think it's great that all of us are sort of conscious of the importance of ethics in these situations. I wonder whether something that Jane, you touched on ever so delicately at the end of your last statement with regards to are we empathizing with the machines that we're creating to generate empathy? Or are, we, are these machines allowing us to empathize more with others? And I know that was a point that you raised very briefly in your statements as well. And is it this other thing that we're uh, uh, being emphatic to, this machinic construction that we're being emphatic to? Or does it actually teach us how to be empathetic to other people? Is there a challenge there? I mean, at least in, in our work, for sure, there's definitely, we've seen it in the whole field, like how like the whole of cybernetics just kind of funnels all of human culture and interaction through it and so forth and what, what the effects of that are. But, uh, uh, and how we kind of, all our effects and stuff are, are modulated through these systems, whether it's, you know, Facebook or our phones or anything, you know, like, I mean, this is just one more thing in that direction. So personally, the way we've approached it from the work we're doing is, uh, it's like, you know, it's a way of getting people to have a dialogue. Like, if you told someone, oh, you're going to come and, like, meet this stranger and you'll be in a little dark room and they'll tell you their story and you can hold hands and stuff, you'd be like, well, no, that's too intimate, you know? But as soon as you say, oh, there's VR and it's whatever, it feels safe. You know, people, like, want to go in and, and have this kind of mediated experience, which is safe. You, they get a bit disoriented with the whole thing because it's very intense. And at the end of it, they meet the person that they just were, you know, that they just swapped with. And I think that's really the important part there for the work that we that we care about, which is actually kind of pushing people towards you know changing certain actions or understanding things, um, is that it creates a space for dialogue that isn't virtual anymore and is outside of that system. So that's that's the way we tackle it with uh, the work we're doing specifically, at least. And Jane, I wonder through the work that you're doing, what new things are you learning about our ability as human beings to empathize? Yeah, um, I think that it's been interesting listening to you guys about ethics um, and very much about how people should leave in the same state or better. Quite often I leave the theatre or film feeling a lot worse than I did when I went in. And I quite often get pangs of that for the next week or year. It's interesting how, I don't know whether we have a bit more license to do that. Um, but yeah, quite often I do feel worse and that might be because it's boring. It might be because it's really scary or really challenging. Um, but back to the question was more, give me, I veered off a bit. I'm well, too what excited. Are you, what, are you, what are you learning from empathy through some of the uh, projects that you're doing? Are you learning something new about empathy or our ability as human beings to empathize? Um, empathy's played a really large part in my life from when I was very, very small. Um, I guess I've used it since when I was about eight I wrote a letter to Stam Hussein because I felt like the only way he was able to do what he was doing was because he didn't understand the impact it was having on other people. So I felt like if he could empathize, 
I don't think I didn't know the word empathy. I don't think at that age so well, but that's how I've had that relationship with the world. And empathy can be very damaging as well. Sometimes I can try to empathise um, in situations when actually that's quite dangerous for me. Um, and it's been interesting to hear other people's experiences of empathy and the trouble it's got them into as well. I think that's been empathy's been used a lot with VR technology. It's, been, it's a term that often comes up. Um, and what's been really interesting for me is about the trouble it's got people into as well as the good things that it's done for relationships. I think that's one of the biggest lessons. Is there something unique about empathy and VR? Are they strange bedfellows or are they things yeah. that, because this thing is so intimate yeah. to your face, that suddenly empathy is assumed to be a thing that you experience through this um, platform? I want to start with, you know, one of the um, thing I wanted to talk about, like why I sort of, I, why I became interested in VR. So I was, you know, I came to London 2004 doing a master project, uh, doing my master study, and uh, um, and I came here, I didn't speak much English at all, and I realized how much I kind of start locking myself at home and just, you know, going to a place, not understanding everything. Everything becomes, social interaction becomes something very scary. And, uh, but I used to be a really confident person in China, quite sort of uh, extroverted. Um, but then I, and then I met my um, PhD supervisor, Mel Slater, and he, he mentioned this concept of social phobia. He described this situation, this group of people who are too afraid of interacting with other people, and so they lock themselves at home. And if I heard this story when I was still in China, I wouldn't you know, take notice of it. But that was the point when I actually started experiencing social anxiety that I never really uh, experienced before. So in a way, I was able to emphasize with my own experience allowed me to emphasize with those people, and that was my very motivation of going into virtual reality. So afterwards, I haven't really directly dealt with empathy. We try to create empathic virtual characters who sort of, you know, react to you, look at you, and maybe even blush when, you know, when they feel embarrassed. So I try to study this quite a lot in terms of how empathy works in VR. We also uh, have work about you know, we all sort of subconsciously copy each other when we, you know, interact, and it's very much unconscious, and we try to study that with virtual characters, how much we copy each other's some simple movement, how much your movement will actually have an impact on how high I raise my arm, these kind of things. And I, I believe all this kind of contribute into how we empathy, empathy with each other. So that's kind of my take of this question. I don't know if I answered it, but... But does it have to be VR? What is special about VR? So I know, Julie, some of the work you were doing in gaming early on as a form of um, not looking at empathy as such, but looking at violence inside of gaming, how that can be used as a medium just like VR. Why is VR special is what I'm trying to, trying to ask this panel. What is, what is it about the headset? It's so different from any other medium, whether it's film or radio or gaming or, yeah, that's an or language. That's an interest. I just something that's related might, might not directly answer your question. We were talking about um, our reaction when we see a robot comparing to we see a virtual character in VR. So when we see a robot, we pretty much treat the robot like an object. We don't associate any mental state to the robot to the same extent as we see a, another human being. But when you see a virtual character there, there are lots of things going on in your head, you start sort of having a theory of mind of this virtual character automatically. And this will enable, enables us to, you know, um, uh, have empathy, attribute empathy to this person. And also as uh, Jane's work, very, and also Christian's work very much about, you know, embodiment with video. And in VR, we can embody you in another body with body tracking. So instead of seeing somebody else's somebody else body through video display, we see a virtual character who matches exactly with your own body if you get the tracking right. So which means that when I wave my hand in front of me, I have the hand mountain display there, I see a hand waving in front of me. And we have this visual motor contingency. And that's giving me a strong illusion this hand and mine. Which means that I can manipulate the shape and color of this hand. And that goes into empathy that you can, I can embody myself in the body of a big Caucasian man or a black woman, which I think is a very interesting um, thing to do. And Mel Slater's work has already shown that embody a Spanish Caucasian into the body of a black avatar actually uh, reduces 
their implicit racial bias. So there's already evidence showing that um, specifically in VR. And, and VR, I mean, you said it earlier, is you can do things that you can't do in reality. Exactly. And you said it earlier, is that you can have an artistic license as well, more so in your area than in ours. Um, but the idea that kind of going into the world of art and going into the world of things where you can make stuff, um, I think like your moral dilemmas task, we know that we get different results when we get people to use different mediums. We know that if you use more senses, the more real it is, and the more it is going to be similar to what you're going to do in, quote, the real world, or as I like to call it, in the wild. Um, so in your kind of situation, the fact that you're saying that you're, when the wind, the wind from the train happens, and the, the smells from the, the, the train station, and the, the eye closure, and the eye opening, and the moving, what you're doing is the, the experiential equivalent of what I'm doing in memory land, where you're getting people to create memories by actually experiencing those things as if they were happening to them. Same with you, not quite as many senses, but more senses than we've ever been able to use before. And more, because like your sense of space, right? Yeah, your sense of movement, much. that's a sense. We need to go far beyond the five senses to have this idea of proximity to things. These are all senses. And the more of those you use, the more real it is, and the more likely that's going to tell us something about what people are going to do when faced with these actual situations, which is important for understanding what makes us human. And so in my world, what I do is I hijack all those processes, and I do what I call memory hacking, where I create these false memories, um, where the way it works is by getting you to picture all of these components. If I just get you to imagine committing a crime, you'll go, that's nice and you'll peg it off and you'll flag it in as something I once imagined. Maybe even something I imagined a bunch of times in a research setting. The reason it turns into a false memory is because I'm not just getting you to picture what it looks like. I'm asking you to picture what it smells like. I'm getting you to picture what it tastes like, what it feels like, what the weather is like. I'm engaging as many of your creative senses as possible because normally that's what differentiates things that we've just imagined from things that we've experienced. And so you guys are creating memories that are multisensory that are going to last and potentially have an impression on people later. And I'm trying to do that artificially because I can't possibly get people to actually commit crimes. Um, so it's, it's the same idea where you're getting this multisensory complex network of brain cells um, that really can impact the way somebody thinks about the world. But, but is immersion reliant on engaging all of the senses? Or are you finding sometimes with some of your work that less is actually more? Um, it depends. Like, uh, there's certain things that need to be like perfectly done. Like, timing is is perfect. It has to be perfect for it to work well. Um, the more senses you engage, obviously, the the better the illusion works. You know, the there's different things like resolution and so forth. Like, we were using we were working before Oculus came out. We were using like some old stuff from the '90s that we stole from university and some like other kind of uh, cheaper different setups and somehow your brain fills in the gaps you know when it's when it's happening but with the increase of resolution it's definitely increases the effect as well a lot more so in, in, in how we've gone about things. Did you find the same? It's all very much about attention to detail because something can be a distraction so I think um, in terms of designing the 360 films or the VR films it's just very important to pay attention to detail I think that's what pulls people out of it. So if um, bringing in another sense is a distraction and you're just doing it for the sake of it or because it's clever technology or because then actually that can be a real problem for the experience, it can pull them out of it. It's very easy to pull someone out of an immersive experience. I guess it's exactly the same. And I don't know if virtual reality pieces are necessarily more intense than other forms of storytelling and art. I think that storytelling can be really high impact. I think there's lots of ways to create. I, I think VR is a really interesting platform. It's a new platform to explore. But I also think that audio can be really immersive. I think that live performances, films, conversations you have at bus stops can just be really, can have a high impact and promote empathy. Or I wonder, I keep hearing that term, virtual reality storytelling, and I wonder if there is any element of storytelling inside of VR, or if it's purely true VR should be where you put someone in a situation and let them generate their own story. 
I wonder that tricky term storytelling, can it be applied as, as linearly to VR as it is to say film or? or Designing interaction is the most difficult problem in VR because you can't really control what people do and you can't get people to do role play in VR because we believe it do not work. Right. Right? We like people to come in just as they are and then something happened to them. That's what we believe when VR works as, as, it, as it best. And talking about multisensory in VR, I mean, basically most of, most of research so far has been on visual uh, stimulation from VR. Audio as well is quite easy to have 3D audio um, quite realistically. But I mean, smell, I've been to a uh, lab in Switzerland where I have to put a tube in my nose and in the sort of cave-like uh, system. And if I get close to some flowers, I smell um, nice perfume flower, um, smell from the flowers. So that's a bit tricky, but they can be done. But difficult one is haptic feedback, uh, sense of touch and textile. So we have like, uh, I saw massive machines at the lab of UCL, like one arm this big, just to have sort of simple sort of touch feedback, but quite reliably. Uh, so that's still a really difficult part to tackle. But even when you're talking about visual display, the way we do it is we have, you know, virtual characters populated in the virtual scenario. Sometimes we feel less is more. So if you just have virtual character, have no facial expression, sitting there looking at you, you start attributing mental states to this character, making up stories, and that works quite well, interesting, uh, in a very interesting way as well. Are you finding that there's an ideal duration or a set period of time with the work that you do? People have to have this experience then go away for, I think it's a week before mm -hmm. they come back and have that memory. And with your work with Be Another Lab, are you finding there's like a, this amount of time and someone is finally immersed? Or is everybody different? Does everybody have a different experience with these projects and these, um, these pieces of work. Yeah, yeah. People, uh, people are very different in, in their responses. Uh, part of our design process has been that, well, basically, we got really lucky. We were working for like a year and a half with no attention from anybody, and then Oculus Rift came out, and then they sort of like, one of our videos went viral, and so people started inviting us everywhere. So we're like, oh, brilliant. So we went, and basically, we're uh, like updating the system on the fly in all these spaces. So we were running the code straight from the IDE. Uh, each person that was coming in, we were changing parameters and seeing how they responded, and then really just doing kind of user kind of folk centered design about how we iterated through the system. And, and definitely, people are so different. And if you've designed something yourself, you'll have you'll be already totally biased for how to interact with it because you know what you should do to, for it to work right. But someone else who has no clue and comes in, they're going to do something you don't expect. So you have to watch what new people do when they're uh, when they're coming in and using an interactive system. I think I think psychologically speaking, um, you are. I don't use VR, but yeah. what I, I think I hijack as well, to use that term again, um, is the, the, the perception of agency. In other words, you're still giving people the feeling like they're doing something and then something's happening, right? So the same thing with the decisions. They're making decisions. Whereas in watching something happen to them or just something on a screen, you're not getting that sense of I'm making key decisions. Um, and I think that's really important because again, that makes it so much more real and it tells us about, well, how do people make decisions? And that's also the problem <laughs> for programmers because lots of people make lots of different kinds of decisions. But overall, there probably are some pretty predictable things, which is why we can make these things work quite well. Um, so I think the feeling, at least, even if it's mostly created. So I give my participants a sense of agency when they don't remember committing the crime that they never committed. Uh, I say, that's OK. Would you like to try a memory retrieval technique? <laughs> And of course, everybody says yes, because they want to remember this thing. Um, and it's totally planned. I'm expecting them to say yes, just like you're expecting them to walk over there to that interesting object, or to drive into this, or to explore this. Um, so I think, but to them, they've made a decision. And I think that's really important for the rea realism that we get, and the, the consequentiality, and the sort of the lasting effects of it. Just wonder if, the, with, the, with regards to that realism, are you aiming for that? Or are you aiming for something completely different? Are you trying to represent the world as it already exists in, in both of your works? Or are you creating an entirely other world? Um, yeah, no, and our work <laughs> is, uh, is, is focused entirely on nonfiction. So uh -huh. we work with people uh, pretty much exclusively that want to share a story. Like, so it's kind of immersive theater, it's immersive documentary. It's VR, it's a bunch of different things together, but it's pretty much focused entirely on nonfiction. So. Uh -huh.
but we don't know that perfect formula yet. We don't have the perfect formula for manipulation, immersion, and empathy. We can manipulate them to a certain extent. You have to sort of, you know, you only have so much energy. If we have unlimited money, then we can <laughs> manipulate to, and, you know, to a unlimited extent. But, you know, there's the funding and, and resources what's limiting us. There are lots of things we can do if we have the money. <laughs> and Time and ethics as well. <laughs> and time and ethics. It's also like, I think the term empathy itself has become really watered down recently anyway with the, the whole hype of the VR, the whole hype of all this stuff, or even it being appropriated by businesses and so forth to kind of stuff that really have nothing to do with empathy. You know, it's kind of become this sort of buzzword that's, you know, like kind of, I guess our work and other work has kind of, you know, gone into that whole thing, you know, and it's, I'm not sure, I think what we need also is to kind of deconstruct what is empathy anyway, where does that idea come from, like what is the kind of, you know, western idea of empathy, what are other ideas of empathy, how do we, you know, explore the, what that could mean in different, in different ways and not just attach it as a nice buzzword to make something that's going to make people feel nice or something, when really that's not, at least in our case, the, the goal of, of, of what it is. And I'm sure our audience empathizes with that. And we're going to go to audience questions. But before we do that, as we always do, uh, Stephen Oram is the Virtual Futures Near Future author in residence. And he has a short five minute um, sort of scientific or science fictional exploration into some of these themes, which may help you think through the question that you may have for our panel. So please, please welcome Stephen. Yeah. Thank you. When, uh, when Luke told me what the theme of this evening was, um, this is the story that came to mind. And it's called... Can you hear okay? It's not called Can You Hear Okay, but Can You Hear Okay? Yeah. It's called I Want To Be Pure For Him. The morning sun streams through the cracks in the blinds, soft and comforting, the exact opposite of how I'm feeling. I woke up convinced that the room was full of chattering people, but the only person in the room is lying next to me, the beautiful and wonderful Rabbi. It's another day of therapy, and a flock of ghosts are clinging to the inside of my skull, refusing to be expunged. I hate it when our bedroom's invaded like this, spoiling the haven of love we've built over the three intense months we've been together. And yet, the more I try to think only of Rabbi, the more the memories of past lovers occupy my dreams. He moves in his sleep, pulling the duvet tighter. I want to know him better, to know him as much, if not more, than the others. But... We've agreed there are no shortcuts. Time and time alone builds what we want. A memory of a stolen kiss tugs at the periphery of my brain. I know it isn't real, that it's someone else's. A snippet of a past lover grafted onto my soul. Intimacy with your lover on a scale previously impossible. That was the promise, and my first time was when I was 17. Madly in love, maybe lust, and very drunk. I remember thinking, why not? I ache to know him better. Him, Kale. I'll never forget him. The first of many, but the first. Special. It was relatively new back then and took a whole day in an immersive VR lab. We worked, each other worked with the programmers, recreating important episodes from our past ready for the immersion. I remember feeling an incredible sense of apprehension as they warned me that it might be irreversible and occasionally trigger mental problems. I didn't care, really. It was exhilarating to think that the man I was head over heels in love with, the man I wanted to spend the rest of my life with, was bearing himself for me, laying down the experiences that made him who he was coded into IVR so I could be immersed in them, in him. Kale's memories became mine and mine his. What could have been more intimate? The edges between us blurred and we understood each other in a way I'd never thought I could. It was wonderful, although sometimes we had the most horrendous disagreements, both of us claiming ownership of a memory, the trauma and how it had changed us. 
I hated that part of it, not knowing what was real and what was false. But most of the time, it was incredible. It was so special for a while, a few weeks, but then Kale was unfaithful. His argument that I knew exactly what childhood event had led to this inevitable betrayal didn't make it any easier. In some ways, it made it worse because I knew how much the affair meant to him, and he knew how much it would hurt me. We split up, and a whole string of short-lived encounters followed. Quite a few, too many, were so jealous of the empathy I had with Kale that they insisted on the same. My head filled with other people's memories, and it became harder and harder to tell them apart. Exactly the opposite of what each of my jealous lovers were hoping for. So many arguments. So many misunderstandings. And then I met Rabbi, the man laying next to me now, gently snoring. Rabbi has never asked for the VR empathy. He's not jealous, or if he is, he keeps it quiet. He's private, a mystery, and I love it. We've set a wedding day. We're getting married. We're taking the risk. I'm having therapy to erase all the false memories, steadily stripping away all that's not mine. But they're protesting. Those falsely implanted memories don't want to disappear. And as they go, I feel deprived. I grieve. This morning is particularly bad. They must be expelled. They have to go. Rabbi is stirring. I breathe deep breaths and think of the lazy days we spent by the river soaking up the sun and each other. I don't want him to see the pain I'm enduring. He opens his eyes. Morning, he says. Memories? I smile and kiss him. Not for much longer. So true. And then I'll have my very own pure and untainted lover. I kiss him again. He stares at me a little longer than feels comfortable. I wonder if I'll like the new you, he says as he runs his finger through my hair. I swallow. It's an unknown, a risk we're both taking. Of course you will. How could you not? There's sadness in his eyes. I hope so, he says. So, any <coughs> questions from our panelists? Jazz. Um, I think there is a formula for empathy. Um, many years ago, I was training with the Samaritans. And I went on to do work at the Priory. And you, when you work with people who are suicidal, or um, have depression, or have a number of other issues, then one of the things that comes out of that is oddly something uh, so I saw being commercially applied within British Telecom. I was responsible for training customer service agents with the chairman's office on rapport. <coughs> and rapport involves employing sympathy and empathy in the right proportions. It turns out they're on a spectrum. And there are seven factors, it turns out, which allow you to move from one end to the other. And uh, in electronic empathy, especially with VR, I think there's two of those factors that are used strongly, but unfortunately, five of those factors are completely missing. Um, except, I think, for what you're doing, Julia, a lot of those are actually used in what you do. And those seven factors are, first of all, at the sympathy end of the spectrum, you simply have acknowledgement that you acknowledge what's happening for the other person. Second, um, there's appreciation you get the significance of what's actually happening. Third is um, affirmation, where you recycle something over and over again, which is linked to the significance. Um, a critical factor is alignment. If your values and your principles and morals and your life experience isn't in some way aligned to what's happening, what's happened for that individual, then there's, there could be a disconnect. Um, but the last two that are probably really, really important are shared observation and shared experience. VR offers shared observation and acknowledgement. Um, it does not allow you to share the experience of the person you're looking at. You can't be inside of them. All you're doing is observing them. So at most you're being a voyeur. And if you can create shared experience, 
then you can literally be in that person's shoes. So the, the last factor is actually how you order those things and what pattern of these things you actually make present. If you get them in the wrong order, for example, you give someone an observation but they're not aligned, or they haven't acknowledged what's going on, then that empathy may never happen. But if you change the order, it can shift the level of empathy that's generated. So what I wanted to ask the panel was, of those things I mentioned, um, acknowledgement, affirmation, appreciation, alignment, observation experience, as well as how they're put together, in your experiences, which of those things, if you wanted to improve what experience people are getting of what you're doing, which of those things would you first work on and why? Wow, okay. <laughs> Good luck. I can explain a little bit in terms of implementing virtual character, uh, especially in terms of uh, non-player character. So it's like if you go into a virtual environment and you speak to a virtual character, you have a conversation with this person. So there are lots of techniques we can use, maybe Wizard of Oz or some machine learning um, algorithm running at the background. We can create some kind of interaction which makes you believe the virtual character is listening to you, acknowledging what you're saying, and may even copy your uh, posture or gesture to create Report and that's pretty much the direction we're working at. But what you said, this seven factors, this is the first time I heard about it. It's really fascinating. We should definitely talk a bit about it a bit more after this, maybe. But yeah, so that's. But as I said, if we have an unlimited amount of money, there's unlimited of uh, things we can do. <laughs> can I just add that with regards to unlimited money? Um, tomorrow I'm meeting up with the company that owns such and such uh, advertising firm. And they want to look at how do you create experiences between customers and brands by cultivating empathy. They want to look at these specific seven factors and how they can include them in adverts. Hmm. And what I'd everybody, recommend everybody to do is if you go to Google and look up an advert called Like a Girl, it's all about what it is to be like a girl. And if someone's asked to run like a girl, how it's different for an actual girl compared to an adult who pretends to be a girl and does girly-like things. But the way the advert was um, demonstrated was good in terms of those seven factors and how it actually leads you to begin to move towards the empathic end of what it might be like to be a girl and face the problems. Mm. It's actually an advert for always tampons. <laughs> so you should check that out. Well, the thing we're trying to do at VF is trying to put a stake in the ground before advertisers and marketers bastardize all of this and take it in a whole other direction. So, so but I'd be interested to see that, how they're taking those seven things. I just wondered, in response to Jazz's question, if any of those things are uh, top of mind for the work that you guys are doing? Um, at, at least in terms of the work we're doing, we're very much focused on providing a shared experience. I think that's really what it's all about, is that is that kind of actual encounter that happens, rather than something that's removed from the context that you experience and then can kind of, oh yeah, imagine something that just exists as like a, an experience outside of this, this interaction. Um, so we've put a lot of effort into doing that. Part of it initially was because of the limitations of the technology which made us do this, but finding out how valuable that is, we've, we've definitely focused on keeping that in there. The other stuff, I think, it depends, no? Because it's like, it's very much up to the person, like the user in this case, or whoever that comes in, that they, you, you know, they have to, in order for them to empathize, it's up to them to make that decision. You can only try to facilitate that through the interaction, through how it works. It's, you know, you can't make them empathize. You can't force them to. I mean, I suppose you can hijack their kind of, you know, sort of, proclivities in one direction or another, you know, which is the, the point of advertising and this kind of thing in there, but um, definitely you have to, you know, for it to be, I think, like, real, I think it has to come from them and you have to, there has to be an exchange. It's, it's relational, you know, like, really, I think. Yeah, this reminded me of one of the work I did. So we create a uh, shy avatar and a confident, more aggressive avatar with Act, actress coming in and try to sort of perform and did motion capture, applied, uh, applied it on our avatars and had participants coming in interviewing this person. So the avatar says exactly the same thing in two conditions, but in one condition she's shy and nervous, in the other one she's like aggressive. 
And our hypothesis is that we also measure participants' own personality, how extroverted and introverted they are. Our hypothesis was that if you're an introverted person, you might feel more empathy with this shy avatar. If you're extroverted, you feel more empathy with the confident one. Have nothing like that in our result. Actually, we had something really interesting. We had a shy participant who had interaction with a shy avatar, and he said, I hated her. She's too anxious. You know, I really hate shy people, but like, he's really pretty shy himself. So this just tells us like human interaction is very complex, and we don't really understand how we interact with each, with each other. So um, and when we want to translate that into VR, because we don't have the knowledge, it doesn't work. Yes. But that's not, that's not, that doesn't always work, you see. Like, if you're shy, I put a shy avatar there, there's no guarantee you will like this shy avatar. That's just how, yeah. Yeah, exactly. In, so. in false memory research, uh, there has never, as far as I know, been an introverted researcher who's been able to generate false memories. You have to be able to gain rapport with the participant, and part of that extroversion really helps. Because you're asking questions, you're going in towards the person, they feel like, you're connecting more. Um, so personality in terms of researchers and the person creating. So this might also interact with who's making the game and what they think that's supposed to look like. Um, so there's so many levels here. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, but it did make me wonder, when you were talking about reality and approaching reality, um, sometimes I wonder, so <laughs> I was vegetarian for a very long time. And people kept trying to tell me that tofu is not like meat. And I'm like, that's fine. It's tofu. It's something different that I also enjoy. Sometimes I feel like that with virtual reality, that I'm not entirely convinced that we need to go all the way to reality, because we're not going to get there, and just to treat it as another experience that doesn't need to be identical, but can still have, you can certainly generate fear responses in video games. You can certainly generate empathy, presumably, it seems. <laughs> in virtual reality situations. So it's the question of how far do we actually need to go in order to get the response we want. And I'm not sure that you need to go all the way uh, or in all the same ways as you would with, with a re real person or with a person who you're interacting with um, in, in not virtual reality. Yeah. I mean, shared experience plays a huge part in what I do. I think that there's been a problem, also, or from my own experience, the VR work that I've seen has focused very much on being putting me in a very frightening situation. So being on a roller coaster, being chased by zombies. I think that um, I was exploring designing a high impact um, 360 experience using shared experience. So the piece we've just made, we create the set around them so we use touch taste so it feels the same as it looks. And um, you look down and you see my hands and you see my body, and you follow my actions, and you um, hear my thoughts, and you're looked at in the same way as I'm looked at. So it's about putting people in a restaurant, which is a familiar environment for them. It's about making someone feel safe. It's about, oh, I've been here before. I've been to this restaurant, or I felt like this in a conversation. I felt like I'm left behind, and then just pushing it further and further and further. And I think that that's been a way to promote empathy with the work that we're doing is keep it, make it something that could happen to anyone. And I think that, yeah, so use that a bit. Any other questions? It's all, wow. Oh, this is going to be hard. OK, please. I, you mentioned the word dreams in your, in your reading, so I was curious about the relationship between dreams and virtual reality, both as ways of processing experience and changing perceptions. Um, are, are dreams kind of Reality. So the relationship between dreams and virtual reality. This is such a big question. I mean, I'm not a psychologist and you're a scientist. So I know, I know dreams is extremely compli complicated. So, what she's uh, saying is we know nothing about dreams. Yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is accurate. Um, yeah, for virtual reality, though, I mean, I could see it be an inspiration. And in a way, it's a fake reality. Not, not virtual, maybe not, but... Yeah, it's, uh, it's our endogenous VR system, I suppose, that we've kind of you know, evolved with or whatever. It's, uh, you know, it's an alternate reality you go into that other people aren't part of. You're in there on your own, and it's very relevant to you. It's very personal. It engages uh, all your senses in different ways, and there's possibilities within there which aren't possible within uh, normal reality. So um, I don't know if there's like, much relation between the work we do specifically and dreams so much, uh, other than in a like poetic way, let's say, uh, on occasion, but uh, 
not in terms of uh, research so much. I'm not sure personally how good of a tool VR is for researching dreams necessarily. I think it's very different directions. Like. I guess my question really is, is it, I mean, I'm, I know a bit about fear and neurons and things like that, in terms of trying to process and understand the way humans exist and think and be, is, is the, the form of virtual reality then a medium that is closer to our, I don't know, I think, I think I can actually answer this. <laughs> Didn't think I could initially. Um, I was just uh, talking to a neuroscientist from France who implants false memories in sleeping mice. Uh, and he does a lot of, look it up, with light. I mean, he cuts their skulls open, not so nice. But it, with light, still, crazy. Um, and he does a lot of work on, on dreaming and why we dream and what it is. And the reason he can create false memories in mice, what he does is he separates a fear response with a location. So rats go into a maze, get shocked. Then during sleep, he separates it. And so when they go back, they don't, they're not afraid of that space when they're approaching it again, and they freely go back into it, whereas the <coughs> rats that haven't been muddled with go in, uh, sorry, are afraid. Um, so, but what he strongly suggests sleep is, which I think most memory scientists certainly would suggest, and most neuroscientists, is that it's a uh, consolidation process. So what you're often, so the reason you dream about your fears and stuff, people you know often, and things that you, maybe in weird ways, but things related to the day, let's say, or your life, um, are because it's in a way, it's, it's a replay and a consolidation of your memories. So it's, it's really laying down much, much faster, which he was talking about as well. That's sort of in real time, when you're walking around, you can watch a memory happening. And then in dream time, it's like 10 times faster, but the same neurons are activated repeatedly. And if it's consolidated, so if it's reactivated enough times, that's when it becomes a long-term memory. And so, so we need sleep to form memories, for sure. And in a way, dreams might be a byproduct, although we're not entirely sure, of that replay. So kind of going over and over again. And sometimes in that, those neural networks, as we call them, right? So cells that are connected to each other in the brain that are what we call memories. Um, sometimes those networks activate other networks, which is why our dreams get weird. Um, so it's, I think that it is different in that one is sort of a replay, whereas this is a new engagement. Um, and I, I think in that sense there would be more overlap maybe with things like drugs. So like hallucinogenic drugs where you're changing your senses uh, intentionally and then you're experiencing something new that you're then able to make into a new memory. I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> Yeah, we, we can definitely use VR to sort of represent the sensory experience you have after drugs or with mental uh, disorders. So I've been working with students trying to recreate the vision of uh, people of uh, people with autism, for instance. They perceive the world in a different way, but maybe we can use VR or AR to kind of overlay overlay the world to represent what they actually see. So for uh, healthy individuals, we have the chance to experience how they experience, so we can maybe have some kind of more empathy with them. So that's, yeah, kind of also related to what Julia has just said. Any other questions at all? So one from the back, just there. And shout if you can, please. It's called it the brain into a reality other than one like previously assumed was the real reality. How far does our current legal framework of thought have application in that space. Could I, do you think, speculate some kind of legal framework of deception? If this technology is more prevalent, you know, there is a legal framework right now that might deceive you into giving you money or deceive you into taking kind of action, how might that apply to this reality? <laughs> so, so the question was, are there any legal frameworks in the law or any lacunas in the law which would... I think even, even you know, our current legal frame, you know, it's not, we're not 100% happy with our current legal frame. If you conducted the crime, what is there to blame? Is it you who conducted the, the, the crime or your motivation? What has caused you to conduct this crime? Poverty or, you know, mental disorder? Where do we draw the line? So our current legal system is far from perfect. And, uh, you know, I guess this is more for Julia to answer in terms of, you know, when we implant false memories, how, how does that add in terms of challenge to, to the current legal frame? If we want to talk about deficits yeah. in the legal system, we're going to be here a long time. Um, <laughs> So you're asking whether or not there should be legal precautions around deceiving people to think that they've done or experienced things that aren't real? Is that the question? It could be, yeah. 
I have not. Okay, we can be a quick one. All right. So on that note, one, I want to know what Ben's done, and two, any other questions? Please. Um, I was wondering, so we're talking about uh, engineering everything people um, as a, well, it seems to me as an, as an industry, it's something that people are looking at. Well, it seems to me as an interesting thing that we want to see how far we can go and see where it can take us. I was thinking about those who perhaps need empathy or those situations in which we perhaps need empathy most. So some examples would be uh, rehabilitating prisoners or uh, divorcing couples or even larger scale in, in large scale conflict resolution. If you've got the Israelis and the Palestinians at two second negotiating table, to what extent can you use the techniques that you guys are talking about to actually help them walk around in their shoes? VR, VR on the Gaza Strip, is that what you're suggesting? Uh, <laughs> um, I actually have uh, recently saw this work uh, published in an uh, Israeli uh, research lab where they had Israeli and Palestinians talking to each other, but Israeli is a real person, Palestinian is a virtual character. And what they did is they put sort of a tracking system on the, on the Israeli, so the Palestinian is able to copy their movement. And apparently that increases empathy and rapport in their interaction and lead to, led to more positive outcomes. So that's definitely a very interesting uh, area politically. Um, yeah, we've been, we've been actually, this is one of the goals of what we're trying to do with, uh, with our work. It's research what we're doing really, so we're not like making any promises that this is going to work, but we've definitely tried to facilitate these encounters. We were working in Israel and Palestine doing some initial kind of experiments there in different places. Um, and it's interesting. Uh, again, it's like the scale of the problem is huge, and it's like, it's really kind of insane that you need a technological solution for this. It's like, it shouldn't be the case, right? You know, like, sh we should be able to find better ways of doing this. But, you know, at least in terms of, uh, of going there and doing stuff, we can talk more later, but we've, we've done some initial experiments in, in some of these contexts with the goal of facilitating that. We're here now as well this week in London and next week as well we're doing workshops with refugees over here with the Good Chance Theatre that's a theatre group that was based in the Cali jungle um, so we'll be doing some performances like narrative performances of refugees that are in London swapping with bodies of Londoners that are here at the moment uh, and seeing what happens with that you know trying to address these kind of issues of conflict I guess. Could you ask a prisoner who to violent crime against someone to walk around the I'd really like to do that. I'd quite like to put the person that attacked, the people that attacked me, into a VR experience and see the world from my perspective. Um, I actually wanted to meet them, um, but they, they weren't, they were too coward to meet me. But um, I'd like to explore that. I'd like to research that and um, test it out and see the impact that might have. Um, I, think that, I think that empathy has been raised and addressed and it's been talked about so much is quite interesting. I think it's going to be, I'm really excited about how it's going to be used, how technology is going to be used to promote empathy in the future. But yeah, I'd really like to do that. I'd really like to um, implement it as a training program in Parliament and things like that for the people that make the decisions, um, to put them in the shoes of the people that they're making the decisions about. Probably time for two more questions. This gentleman here. Hi, thanks. Uh, so I'm a software developer, so I make games and apps for, for headsets, mm -hmm. for VR glasses. And uh, so I don't usually deal with empathy, but actually there's one thing that is connected to it that worried me some time ago and still worries me. So one thing that you learn when you have a headset is that when you start moving, like in a car, up front or sideways, you get dizzy because actually you don't feel the acceleration, the acceleration. This is a problem that many people have with virtual reality. But what you will learn if you do it for many hours or many days is actually you can get used to it. So you can actually teach your brain that you don't need to get dizzy because this is, this is actually something that was evolutionary probably built into us, that something is wrong, you can learn not to be, not actually get dizzy. And then I realized, after playing one of the games, actually a few games where you actually you know, move 
fast in a car or like inside a cave, that when you see kind of like rocks, you, 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 if you try to pull your, put your head so that it hits the rock, but you have this feeling of, okay, you, you will get hurt. But if you do this many times enough, you stop getting scared of it, right? Because you, you don't die, right? So it stops being scary. And after doing it many times, as in kind of like in many games, what I realized really scared me that when I was walking here down the street and I saw a big double-decker bus going past me, I got an idea. What if I put my head? <laughs> right? and, you know, usually a year ago, this would just send shivers down my spine just thinking about it. But now it didn't because I've done it so many times that my brain kind of learned that this is not a scary thing. And going to the empathy part, so in the future, more and more people will be using headsets. They will be playing games, war games. They will see other people. And aren't you afraid, what's your opinion on this, that actually we will get uh, less empathy, we'll actually learn that you can kill people, you can touch people, you can beat people, and somehow it will be depleted of your natural kind of like reflexes that this is wrong, because you do this so many times, just like me, I stop being afraid of putting my head in front of the bus, and I'll just stop being, you know, like afraid of head killing another person. I think it's actually a real concern, and what's your take on this? Are you yeah. afraid of it? No, definitely. That's actually my very reason of going into VR is that I feel that I need more real life interaction. I want to use VR, which has been used in so many other things, but I want to use it differently. I want to use it as a tool to help us go back to real social interaction. So that's, that's my motivation. And as you said, VR can be quite dangerous if you don't use it correctly. I mean, I can imagine so many nasty sort of trainings that if, it, if it's in the hand of the wrong group of people, you know, they can use this for training to get people to kill each other. So that's, I think there's definitely massive ethic concerns that hopefully, you know, uh, someone's talking about it, but well, yeah. So I, yeah. Uh, I actually did some research on this. Um, a couple of years ago, I had people play Grand Theft Auto, and I wanted to see whether or not it made them think more like criminals. So obviously, not in VR, just regular <laughs> Grand Theft Auto. Um, and, but the idea is that they were running around and killing people and hurting people and stealing things. Um, and I also had in my control condition people just running around Grand Theft Auto and going to the same places but doing non-criminal things. So instead of going to the bowling alley and shooting everyone until the police come, they went bowling. <laughs> uh, so anyways, um, in this situation, what, what I found, and I compared that to watching the news or watching other violent things or doing neutral things, um, and what I found is that playing Grand Theft Auto, at least in the short term, did increase what, what we refer to as criminal thinking, so how much people associate with me and crime, which goes in that direction of what you're talking about. And there's a huge controversy, obviously, about the video games and violence debate. Uh, do video games cause violence? Does violence cause uh, get people to play vid violent video games? Is there any link at all? Most people don't respond. It's complicated. Um, but there is some evidence to suggest that repeatedly doing something in VR or gaming or in general uh, does desensitize you to those things, which is why they also use it for things like training people to kill people for combat training. Um, so, I mean, we do do that. We, we use it explicitly to desensitize people for good and good purposes and bad purposes. Uh, certainly something to keep in mind. <laughs> so, on that note, I'm going to have to conclude. And uh, firstly, just a couple of thanks. So I want to thank uh, Swara Kadir and Kevin Thompson. Um, these guys have been working with us for a while, and it's because of them that we were able to make all of our uh, video content available um, online. I also want to thank Dr. Dan O'Hara, who's just standing here, and next to him, Ben Greenaway, and Tom Ward, who were the contributors to thinking around this, uh, this panel. And I also want to remind um, attendees that if you love what we do, we always want feedback. Mostly the feedback is like try and keep the lights on and turn the sound up. But if you, if you have any other feedback with regards to what we're doing here, then we'd love to hear it. So I hope you haven't felt too hijacked. Uh, I hope that you now have an idea of what the formula for empathy is. I advise you to keep your head away from buses. And I am wishing you weird dreams. And let me end with this. The future is always virtual. And some things that may seem inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not predicated on our capacity for prediction. Although, and it's on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable comes of staring the future 
deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that tonight. Please join me in thanking these absolutely fantastic panelists. The bar is now open.